Good morning. Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law will come to order. On behalf of Mr. Cicilline and myself, I apologize for the two, three, or four times that this hearing has been postponed and rescheduled, uh, but it's, uh, it's not like we weren't doing anything. We, we, we had a lot of things going on and still do, but please accept our apology. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on recent trends in international antitrust enforcement, and I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Antitrust and competition laws have existed in the United States since the late 1800s. It was not until the last 30 years, however, that the adoption of such laws began to spread globally. Today, nearly every nation in the world has some form of antitrust or competition law. As a result of this global expansion, there have been efforts to enhance consistency and advance best practices through the establishment of several international organizations. These organizations include the International Competition Network, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development Competition Committee, and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. U.S. antitrust agencies have been active participants in these international organizations with the goal of promoting consumer welfare and economic efficiency as the top priorities of competition policy. Despite their efforts, consumer welfare and economic efficiency are only one aspect of a multitude of goals in the global antitrust regulatory environment. These goals frequently include several other unrelated factors. For example, competition rules in several foreign jurisdictions include inherently subjective concepts such as protecting fair competition and social public interest, and even promoting the healthy development of the socialist market economy. These subjective factors often result in legal treatment of business conduct that differs profoundly on a case-by-case -case basis, as is often driven by political considerations. These differences have begun to have considerable impact on U.S. companies and citizens. In particular, there have been recent concerns relating to due process in foreign jurisdictions, the treatment of intellectual property rights, the imposition of extraterritorial remedies, and non-action against state-owned enterprises and national champions. A recent report issued by the International Competition Policy Expert Group and commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce found that certain of our major trading partners appear to have used their laws to actually harm competition by U.S. companies, protecting their own markets from foreign competition, promoting national champions, forcing technology transfers, and in some cases, denying U.S. companies fundamental due process. We convene today's hearing to examine the enforcement of competition laws across the globe with a focus on this report and recommendations to address these prevalent issues. It is essential we ensure that U.S. companies are treated fairly, consistently, and objectively by international jurisdictions. Today's hearings will help us inform the committee regarding several recent trends in international competition law enforcement. Additionally, the hearing will provide us insight in how the administration and the executive agencies can coordinate with each other on the treatment of U.S. companies and citizens abroad. We have an excellent set of witnesses before us today who will help us to evaluate these issues more fully and consider the next steps in addressing them. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony.
Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law, Mr. Cicilline, former mayor in the state of Rhode Island, my friend, uh, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome uh, to our witnesses. And I, too, apologize for the inconvenience in scheduling, but really grateful that you're here. Uh, today's hearing will focus on a recently issued report by the International Competition Policy Expert Group concerning the need for fair, transparent, and impartial enforcement of competition laws internationally. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce commissioned this report for the purposes of developing recommendations for a potentially more effective and better integrated international trade and competition law strategy. According to the report, there is increasing concern among American businesses that some major trading partners are, in some cases, denying foreign companies fundamental due process and, in other cases, applying their competition laws to protect their home markets from foreign competition, promote national champions, and or force technology transfers. Although this report did not engage in fact-finding or a study of specific cases involving procedural unfairness, it made a series of recommendations to address this overarching concern. These recommendations include the establishment of a White House working group to study and address these concerns through targeted sanctions. While I agree that resolving procedural divergence in international antitrust enforcement is a laudable goal, I'm concerned that the use of extraordinary trade remedies to resolve minor disputes may undermine our national interests. This is particularly true given the, that nations may not apply their own laws in a discriminatory manner against American companies under current law. For example, the dispute settlement body at the World Trade Organization has provided the U.S. with an avenue to pursue or defend trade disagreements. As of 2015, the United States was a direct party to 232 cases either as a comp complainant or as a respondent. The U.S. has won or settled without litigation a majority of these active cases. The United States has more than a century of experience in developing and expanding the antitrust laws. Over the past several decades, the United States antitrust agencies have relied on this experience to engage their international counterparts in ongoing, thoughtful dialogue to build consensus on advancing competition and reduce cross-border inconsistencies. These relationships are built on a foundation of trust and mutual respect. Whether it's a memorandum of understanding, a joint investigation, or just a phone call, international cooperation in criminal and civil enforcement depends on effective communication of shared goals to protect and promote competition. Bilateral cooperation may not work in every case, but it does preserve and strengthen the relationships that will be so crucial to successfully working together in the future, as former Assistant Attorney General Renata Hess observed last year. In contrast, using trade remedies to resolve the procedural concerns of American businesses in international proceedings could backfire. The use of sanctions could have serious, unforeseen consequences and should be reserved, in my judgment, for egregious misconduct. I would also note that working towards substantive and procedural consistency should not be confused with seeking identical outcomes among the more than 130 international competition authorities. Earlier this year, together with ranking member Conyers, and leaders of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, I sent a letter urging additional congressional appropriations for the purpose of reducing corporate concentration through the vigorous enforcement of the Andrew Huss laws. As I noted then, there is mounting evidence of overall decline of antitrust enforcement in the United States over the past several decades. And the alarming result of this decline is increased costs and less choice for consumers, wage stagnation and depression for workers, diminished private investment, innovation, and small business ownership, particularly among minorities, and reduce political freedom due to the outsized political influence of large corporations. American companies should receive fair treatment abroad, but antitrust scrutiny is not, in and of itself, unfair or discriminatory. As Professor Fox will testify today, and I quote, since standards of misuse of power differ, and the U.S. has one of the least interventionist monopoly laws in the world, these American firms may understandably feel that they are unfairly targeted by our sister trading partners, end quote. Just like Congress may establish enforcement priorities through appropriations or antitrust exemptions, international systems may adjust their own enforcement priorities to align with national policy goals. I look forward to exploring these issues in today's hearings. I thank our panel of expert witnesses for their testimony and input on this topic. I thank the chairman for holding today's hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee, Mr. Goodlatte of Virginia, for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your holding this hearing. 
The Judiciary Committee routinely exercises its oversight authority to ensure that our nation's antitrust laws are applied in a manner that is transparent, fair, predictable, and reasonably stable over time. A natural extension of this oversight is ensuring that our nation's companies and citizens receive comparable treatment in foreign jurisdictions. As commerce becomes increasingly global an increasingly global enterprise, the manner in which antitrust and competition laws are applied to companies and citizens located or engaged in business outside of the United States also grows in importance. Over the past several years, reports have surfaced that certain jurisdictions are deploying their antitrust and competition laws in manners that strain the boundaries of due process, focus on advancing domestic industrial policies, or seek to extract valuable American innovations without fair compensation. I would like to thank Chairman Marino for holding today's hearing to delve into these potentially serious abuses and address potential solutions. Today's testimony will help the committee gain a better understanding of the seriousness of these issues and how they might be addressed. Furthermore, it will provide a record regarding how the administration and our executive agencies, including our antitrust enforcement agencies, can coordinate among each other and engage with foreign countries on international competition law enforcement. This hearing also serves as a reminder that the United States should be a leader in fair and reasonable antitrust enforcement. To that end, enacting important antitrust reforms, such as the Smarter Act, will help to ensure that the U.S. continues to be an example to international competition law authorities. I look forward to hearing from today's excellent panel of expert witnesses on these important issues, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee, Mr. Conyers of Michigan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Top of the morning to the witnesses. Uh, we've got a full slate here, and it's appropriate uh, because international antitrust enforcement is a subject that we haven't really neglected. We just haven't got around to yet, and this is a a good first step uh, toward the inquiry and uh, re-examination of a very complex subject. <clears throat> now, given the increasingly interconnected economic relationships among nations, American firms depend on the fair enforcement of antitrust and competition laws by other countries as a critical factor with respect to their ability to do business abroad. Yet some American firms believe, in my view, that certain countries do not consistently apply their competition laws in a sound and non-discriminatory manner. They allege a lack of due process and transparency when these firms have become the target of antitrust investigation by com competition authorities in those countries. Accordingly, we should keep the following points in mind as we discuss foreign antitrust enforcement practices. My greatest concern is whether uh, and to what degree these problematic foreign antitrust enforcement practices impact American jobs. To the extent that foreign antitrust enforcement actions unfairly disadvantage American firms, and to the extent this results in American companies going out of business and American workers losing their jobs, I, of course, am deeply concerned since jobs, justice, and peace is one of my uh, rallying uh, presentations uh, across the years. The witnesses should provide us guidance on just how real and extensive this problem is. That being said, however, there are and should be limits to what we can insist on from other countries. When it comes to antitrust and competition policy, 
Divergencies in outlook and philosophy are not always rooted in a desire to protect national champions or to discriminate against American firms. Various countries may be at different stages of development with laws shaped by culture and historical circumstances that, of course, differ from ours. The uh, where complaints about other countries' laws simply reflect such differences rather than concerns about discrimination, due process, or transparency, we should be careful about overstating our criticism and reaction. And finally, we must be careful not to provoke retaliation against American businesses with any effort to penalize or pressure other countries to change their enforcement practices. Many helpful recommendations have been made regarding how to address the concerns of American businesses about foreign antitrust enforcement practices. The best ones emphasize dialogue, multicultural standards, and agreements on best practices and the promotion of cooperation among international antitrust enforcement agencies. An excessively punitive approach, however, may ultimately prove counterproductive and be harmful to American interests in the long run. And so I thank you for your presence here and uh, look forward with anticipation to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. I will begin today's hearing by swearing in our witnesses before I introduce you. If you would all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you are about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Please let the record reflect that all the witnesses have uh, responded in the affirmative. Please be seated. Thank you. Ms. Garza, and if I mispronounce anyone's name, please do not hesitate to uh, tell me. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Ms. Garza, I will, uh, I'm going to introduce each of you first okay. and then ask you to uh, make your statements. Okay. Ms. Garza is a partner at Covington and Burling and the co-chair of the firm's antitrust and competition law practice group. Ms. Garza has been involved in some of the largest antitrust matters, including the merger of Exxon and Mobil and the U.S. government suit against Microsoft, the U.S. FL suit against the NFL, and many other litigation and regulatory matters on behalf of Fortune 500 companies. Before working at Covington, Ms. Garza served as acting assistant attorney general in charge of the antitrust division at the Department of Justice and also as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Regulatory Affairs, overseeing the matters in the telecommunications, transportation, energy, healthcare, agricultural, insurance, broadcast radio, real estate, and other industries. During two prior tours of service, Ms. Garza served as a special assistant and as chief of staff and counselor to the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division. Ms. Garza was also appointed by President George W. Bush to chair the Antitrust Modernization Commission, a bipartisan blue ribbon panel created by Congress to study and report to the President and Congress on the state of antitrust enforcement in the United States. Ms. Garza received, received uh, her BS from Northern Illinois University and her JD from the University of Chicago. Welcome this morning. Professor Wong Irvin is the director of the Global Antitrust Institute and an adjunct professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. 
Prior to joining GAI, Professor Wong Irvin served as counsel for intellectual property and international antitrust in the Office of International Affairs at the Federal Trade Commission. She also served as an attorney advisor to Federal Trade Commissioner Joshua D. Wright. Prior to working at the commission, Professor Wong Irvin spent almost a decade in private practice focusing on antitrust litigation and government investigations. She currently serves on the International Antitrust Task Force and Antitrust Due Process Task Force of the ABA and was previously co-chair of the ABA's 2016 Antitrust in Asia Conference. Professor Wong Urban is also co-editor of Competition Policy International's North American column and also serves as co-chair for the Federalist Society Antitrust and Consumer Protection Working Group for the Law and Innovation Project. Professor Wong Irvin received her bachelor's degree from Santa Clara University and graduated second in her class from the University of California, Hastings College of Law, where she was associate editor of the Hastings Law Review. Welcome. Mr. Alden Abbott is the Rumpel Senior Legal Fellow and Deputy Director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Prior to joining the Heritage Foundation, he served as Director of Patent and Antitrust Strategy for BlackBerry and in a variety of senior government positions, including Director of Antitrust Policy for the Federal Trade Commission, Acting General Counsel of the Commerce Department, Chief Counsel for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and Senior Counsel in the Justice Department. Mr. Abbott is an adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University and was a visiting fellow at All Souls College, Oxford University, and a Wasserstein Fellow at Harvard Law School. He is also a member of the leadership of the American Bar Association Antitrust Section and a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network. Mr. Abbott received his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, his master's degree in economics from Georgetown University, and his JD from Harvard Law School. Nice to have you with us. Ms. Eleanor Fox is the Walter J. Durenberg Professor of Trade Regulation at the New York University School of Law. Before joining NYU Law, Professor Fox was a partner <coughs> at the New York law firm Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. She has advised numerous younger antitrust jurisdictions, <coughs> including South Africa, Egypt, Tanzania, the Gambia, Indonesia, Russia, Poland, and Hungary, and the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa. Professor Fox was awarded an inaugural Lifetime Achievement Award in 2011 by the Global Competition Review for Substantial Lasting and Transformational Impact on Competition Policy and or Practice. She has served as a member of the International Competition Policy Advisory Committee through the Attorney General of the United States Department of Justice and as a commissioner on President Carter's National Commission for the Review of Antitrust Laws and Procedures. Professor Fox received her bachelor's degree from Vassar College, her law degree from the New York University School of Law, and an honorary doctorate from the University of Paris and here it goes. Dosphine, Daphine, I did not take French. Welcome. Randy M. Stutz is the Associate General Counsel of the American Antitrust Institute, or AAI. Mr. Stutz has broad responsibilities across all of AAI's research, education, and advocacy programs. He has published numerous white papers, amicus briefs, and journal articles on important competition issues. 
He has also served as the co-editor of two handbooks, including the International Handbook on Private Enforcement of Competition Law. Prior to joining AAI, Mr. Stutz practiced antitrust law in the Washington, D.C. office of Skadden, Arps, Slate, and Maher, Mar, thank you, and Flom LLP, where he consulted on merger and cartel investigations and multi-district class actions. Mr. Stutz earns his bachelor's degree in English from Washington University in St. Louis and his JD with honors from the Catholic University Columbus School of Law. Welcome, sir. Each of our witnesses' statements will be entered into the record and into its entirety, but I ask each of you to summarize your statements in five minutes or less. And you, to help you, you see the lights in front of you uh, that will keep time. The light will switch from green to yellow, indicating that you have one minute to conclude your testimony. And when the light turns red, it indicates that the, your five minutes have expired. And I know you're going to be concentrating on your comments. So when we start to get over the five minute mark, I will very uh, diplomatically and politely raise the end of the gavel and give a little tap to give you an indication to, to please wrap up. Ms. Garza, please. Thank you, Chairman Marino, uh, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, Ranking Men Member Cicilline, uh, Ranking Member Conyers, uh, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to appear here uh, today. I've had the pleasure of appearing before the subcommittee in the past to testify on <coughs> recommendations of the Antitrust Modernization Commission and in support of the Smarter Act. And it is always an honor to be invited to address the subcommittee and to witness the good, thoughtful work of its members and the staff. Uh, I'm here today in my capacity as the antitrust co-chair of the International Competition Policy Expert Group, so named so that we could abbreviate it as ICEPEG. Uh, ICEPEG was a bipartisan volunteer group of 13 competition and international trade policy experts that was convened by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in August of 2016 for this purpose to consider how the U.S. can most effectively address the perceived misuse of competition law by some foreign jurisdictions that distorts international trade and harms U.S.-based companies. ICEPEG's members included uh, distinguished academics and thinkers like Professor Eleanor Fox, who is here today, who have studied and participated in the development of international competition and trade policy for decades, and former enforcers and policymakers from every prior Republican and Democratic administration in the past 36 years. And I would like to pause here to recognize that Jim Rill, who was a member of ISPEC, is here with us uh, today. Uh, the Chamber asked this diverse group to leverage our collective experience to develop practical and actionable steps forward that will serve to advance sound trade and competition policy. And that is what we did with a remarkable degree of consensus. A copy of ICEPEG's resulting report and recommendations in our transmittal letter to the President and to the 115th Congress is attached to my statement. My testimony today is limited to ICEPEG's report and recommendations. I am not speaking today on behalf of any specific client interest, and I'm not prepared to talk about any particular investigation or enforcement matter. My testimony will be brief because the ICEPEG report and recommendations speak for themselves and are consistent with my personal views. Uh, simply put, there is a concern that certain of our major trading partners have in some cases denied foreign companies fundamental due process and in other cases applied their competition laws to protect their home markets from foreign competition to promote national champions and or to force the transfer of technology at royalty rates that favor local technology implementers. Such conduct has a significant unfair adverse impact on the ability of U.S. firms to compete at home and in global markets. Uh, Karen Wong Irvin, who's here testifying today, and Alden Abbott have provided examples of some of these things in their testimony. Prior administrations have devoted substantial resources at the very highest political levels to address the problem with some success, but it has been a tough, difficult nut to crack and requires persistent efforts and a multifaceted approach that engages at both the competition and the trade law levels. 
even for those who are wary of the use of trade rules, recognize that the need, the need for a careful, integrated competition and trade law approach. As Professor Fox put it in her testimony, it is time that officials from trade and competition sat down at the table and discussed strategies for the good of the country. Uh, we need to work toward a coherent trade and competition policy that, among other things, tackles unjustified state restraints and the distorting competition of privileged and cronyistic SOEs. And they say, here, here, uh, Eleanor. Um, I won't go, to go into any great length in describing the recommendations that ICEPEG made, but I will say that the first six recommendations focused on the coordination of competition and international trade policy within the U.S. government. We suggested that it be through a White House working group. Uh, among other things, the working group would determine which international agreements should include competition chapters, including through amendment of existing agreements, what provisions should be included, and how those provisions should be enforced. Um, the group, working group would also focus on how to most effectively ensure that other countries apply their competition laws in a matter that is consistent with accepted standards of process to ensure transparent, accurate, and impartial enforcement decisions. I recognize the concerns of some of the members of the subcommittee about the effects of using trade sanctions and the, the uh, effects of overreacting to, to issues. Uh, I'll note that our report suggested some things that were, that many things that fall far short of imposing sanctions. And an example would be to have these competition chapters in these trade agreements that will create a framework for discussion and a less explosive way to deal with these problems as they arise. I thank you for your attention and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Professor Wong Irvin. Thank you. Chairman Marino, Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Cicilline, Ranking Member Connors, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the honor of appearing before you today. My testimony will begin with the discussion of the problem as framed by the Chamber's expert report, and then I'll move on to possible solutions. To begin, I agree with the report that certain foreign governments appear to be using their competition laws in ways that unfairly harm U.S. companies and inappropriately reduce incentives to innovate. These include, first, denying U.S. companies fundamental due process, second, in the case of intellectual property rights, using competition laws to reduce royalty payments by U.S. companies to unduly favor domestic manufacturers and third, imposing unwarranted extra jurisdictional remedies, namely global portfolio-wide remedies on foreign conduct involving foreign patents. Examples of denials of due process include failure to notify the parties of the legal and the factual basis of an investigation, lack of an independent tribunal to review decisions, and the ability to stay remedies pending appeal refusal to allow parties to cross-examine witnesses at hearings, and failure to protect confidential information and recognize attorney-client privilege and other important legal privileges. One case example from earlier this year is the Korea Fair Trade Commission's decision against Qualcomm, in which the agency allegedly refused to allow the company to fully cross-examine witnesses at hearings and sought to act as the world's competition police by imposing global worldwide remedies, including on US patents. Moving on to possible solutions. Based on my experience at the US Federal Trade Commission, it's my belief that public exposure, including expressions of concerns at the highest levels of our government, is one effective means to achieve the desired change. To that end, I favor the report's recommendation to consider creating a listing mechanism for competition enforcement akin to the USTR's annual Special 301 listing of foreign nations that have inadequate IP protections. In my experience, the good news is that most foreign jurisdictions seem to want to be considered part of the international mainstream and respond to public statements of concerns. For example, the egregious alleged violations in China um, against U.S. companies, for example, reportedly locking them in rooms and ordering them to confess their sins under threat of refusing to return their passports, were remedied through a multi-pronged approach, which included a letter from the then Secretary of the Treasury Department 
followed by statements by President Obama to China's President Xi. These public statements were followed by reportedly better process in China and also China abandoning its previously stated intention to impose extra jurisdictional remedies. Lastly, I agree with the report about the dangers of using vague and subjective standards such as fairness and other non-competition goals, such as employment or the healthy development of an economy. And I agree that the U.S. should continue to advocate for a consumer welfare standard as set forth by our Supreme Court. Consumer welfare is a broad concept that values what consumers are willing to pay for. It's also an important standard because it connects competition to the methodological commitments of economics in terms of giving theories that can be tested and rejected. Yet, as has been mentioned here today, many foreign jurisdictions currently explicitly provide for the consideration of non-competition factors. I believe that an effective interim measure is to require transparency from these governments as to what factors they consider and how they are weighed and balanced. I've often found myself when I'm reading foreign competition decisions as if there's missing pages. The analysis may start off sounding like mainstream competition analysis, but then the conclusions often lack ev any evidentiary support and leave me puzzling as to what industrial policy concerns or non-competition factors may have influenced or perhaps dictated the outcome. I believe that requiring transparency in decision-making will go a long way to requiring accountability by foreign jurisdictions and providing some measure of predictability for our companies. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Abbott. Oh, thank you. Uh, Chairman Marino, Chairman Goodlatte, uh, Ranking Member Cicilline, Ranking Member uh, Conyers, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm delighted to be asked to participate here today, and I applaud you for holding this hearing on a very important topic. I'm here because I was asked to serve as rapporteur or principal drafter of the ICEPEG report, which has already been discussed, uh, which represented a consensus opinion of all the ICEPEG's members, not anybody's personal opinion. And by the way, I, again, I want to stress the views expressed today are my own and not necessarily those of the Heritage Foundation. As already emphasized, this was a bipartisan effort, and because it represented the views of tr trade experts as well as antitrust experts, it's not too surprising to find some report recommendations touching on the possible role of trade law as a remedy for foreign for harmful foreign mass misapplication of competition law. Now, as already mentioned, a key aspect of the report is its extensive discussion of consensus U.S. understanding of cons consumer welfare uh, as the heart of antitrust law. This, orient, uh, this ref is reflected in the report's first recommendation, which, quote, calls for the Trump administration to expressly confirm that, as an organizing principle, competition law and policy should focus on eliminating artificial impediments to competition, both private and governmental, as a way of promoting economic growth, innovation, and consumer welfare." Uh, close quote. And let me underscore the fact that the report strongly supports the ongoing excellent work, uh, domestic and international work, of the two federal antitrust agencies, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department's Antitrust Division. Uh, in calling for White House Working Group, it does not call for involvement of non-antitrust agencies or the White House in carrying out American antitrust agency investigations or in the antitrust agencies making a policy determinations uh, in the antitrust agencies regular cooperation with foreign counterparts or in the antitrust agencies periodic uh, consultations involving competition authorities from around the world. Simply put, the report contains no language that would support curbing the independence of the federal antitrust agencies in carrying out their statutory roles, which encompass antitrust-related law enforcement and policy functions. Basically, what the report calls for is better coordination of work on situations where foreign nations uh, alleged misuse of its competi competition law seriously impedes international trade and investment 
by posing an unreasonable, unjustified, or discriminatory burden or restriction on U.S. commerce. Uh, and it does this through a working group, not the idea not being that the working group is going to seize authority, but that it's going to come up with sort of a measured, thoughtful way of looking at allegations. Whether or not there's a working group, if, there, if a major U.S. Uh, company is concerned it's being treated unfairly overseas, people in, on, in Congress and in the administration from different agencies will be hearing about it. The notion of a working group is to create a structure uh, by which uh, the orderly views of the different uh, departments around the, uh, the executive branch and the independent agencies, agencies can be heard. And again, the notion of a working group is not to get in the way of what the antitrust agencies, U.S. antitrust agencies are doing in trying to improve things with their counterparts. Uh, the report also uh, calls for additional works by multilateral institutions in which the U.S. is already heavily involved, including the Organization for Cooperation, Economic Cooperation Development, the World Bank, the International Competition Network, and the World Trade Organization. In particular, as already mentioned, a concern about shaming and naming, or uh, it calls for more peer review studies, open uh, analysis of the application of competition law, because I, I think it's safe to say there's sort of a general consensus view among international economists uh, worldwide that consumer welfare is of central importance, and this is perhaps a way to point to other agencies and point out their need to keep that in mind. Uh, already reference has been made to intellectual property. Uh, I will just briefly mention, put in a plug for uh, the current acting chairman of the FTC, who's done a, a recent article in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public, Harvard Journal of Law and Technology on the problem of intellectual property and competition, well worth reading. Uh, that uh, closes my statement. I would be uh, pleased to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Fox. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Marino, Chairman Goodlatte, um, Ranking Member Cicilline, Ranking Member Conyers, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to appear before you today. Um, I also I was, I was honored to be a member of the Committee of Experts that was organized by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, which Deborah Garza and Andrew Scheuer were co-chairs. Uh, Alden Abbott was a reporter, and I want to thank them for the excellent work that they have done on the problem that we have before us. Uh, so the problem that we have before us has, let's say, three parts. One is definition of what is the problem. Second is how big is the problem? What kind of response does it call for? Um, and third is what to do about it. So I want to say a word about each how big is the problem of U.S. trading partners using their competition laws in ways that are illegitimate that hurt American business. I would like to enlarge that problem to say um, the problem is that nations may use antitrust laws illegitimately outside of the bounds of proper antitrust, um, hurting other countries and their citizens. I want to include the U.S. in that paradigm. I think we are in a position today we have, where we have to watch out also um, to be sure that our own country does not use antitrust politically. It has not yet, but I think that one has to be alert, and the problem is on all sides. Um, how, what exactly is the problem and how big? Um, first, there is a question of substantive law. Are our trading partners using substantive law, antitrust law, in an inappropriate way? Um, second, one could ask about industrial policy. Third, one could ask about nation state restraints, uh, like Chinese SOEs or, or any country's national government use of policy that is harming trade and competition. And uh, lastly, a word about discrimination. Are, putting it to U.S. trading partners, is there discrimination against us? Um, as to substantive law, my view is slightly different from the rest of my committee in terms of should there be one 
particular focus, such as consumer welfare for antitrust law, um, in my view, the problem is a bit larger in that almost every nation agrees that they are trying to make markets work better by their competition law. That is just a little more elastic, giving countries and uh, jurisdictions, even our own jurisdiction, a little more elbow room in defining what is hurting competition. Um, because I have a broader view of what is legitimately called hurting competition. I also have a view that the problem before us may be a little narrower than many of my colleagues think. I think that we must respect how our other, how our trading partners formulate their competition laws, and it's not always how U.S. formulates it, and we must have respect for some formulations that are in general within the confines of a good competition policy. Um, industrial policy, I think we should have respect, except where nations are using their antitrust laws specifically to target us and to hurt us. Um, state restraints, I'll pass on now because of time. Discrimination, I think, is very hard to prove that our trading partners are applying different laws to us than they are to their own companies. And therefore, the problem, as I see it, is slightly smaller. Um, what to do about the problem? There is a problem, and the problem, as my colleagues or panel members have said, includes lack of due process. There is definitely a problem of illegitimate antitrust and antitrust without due process. What to do about it, in my view, is the first best is keep talking. Our competition agency heads in the United States have been very clear and very persuasive to other countries when they see a problem in talking about good standards. It has worked. It has worked sometimes. I think that is definitely the first line of defense. I do not believe that trade remedies ought to be used as sanctions. I do not think they will work. I think they may lead to a race to the bottom. Uh, so um, I do think there must be a working group it might or might not be called White House Working Group, and there's a benefit to taking it out of a possibility of thinking of it politically, but there must be better integration between trade and competition. Um, there was a time I want to recognize Jim Rill, who is here, when Jim Rill was head of the Antitrust Division and Carla Hills was the United States Trade Representative, when we saw perhaps the high point in the integration of trade and competition used at that time to open the Japanese market, among other things. Um, and lastly, I want to say I think the main thing that we have to do in antitrust is keep our eye on the fact competition doesn't know borders and shouldn't. We all gain when competition is free and open without borders and not politicized. We all lose if we become sucked into a, a circuit of tip for tat, you do this to us, we'll do it to you. And I trust our um, heads of competition, Department of Justice, and Federal Trade Commission, who do believe strongly in that principle, incidentally, I trust them very much to carry on the conversation, to call out illegitimate antitrust, and to press on with what we have always had, a cosmopolitan antitrust. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stutz. Thank you, Chairman Marino, Chairman Goodlatte, Ranking Member Cicilline, Ranking Member Conyers, and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear today on behalf of the American Antitrust Institute. The expert report commissioned by the Chamber of Commerce recognizes that U.S. businesses operating internationally face difficult challenges posed by the enforcement of foreign competition law. The report addresses allegations involving due process violations, foreign enforcement under subjective legal standards, and problematic extraterritorial remedies. But as I explain in more detail in my written testimony, there's a good faith species and a bad faith species of each of these allegations. It's important to distinguish between a foreign authority's bad faith denial of basic rights in pursuit of protectionism and its good faith disagreements over appropriate legal standards and how to assess market facts. With this in mind, there are four key points I wish to leave you with today. First, Bad faith conduct by foreign competition enforcers likely does require better coordination between U.S. trade and competition agencies. 
The AAI agrees that trade law, including possibly the threat of trade sanctions, could be a valuable tool in addressing the bad faith denial of fundamental rights like due process and equal protection in competition proceedings. Trade agencies have a strong claim to authority in these circumstances because in many respects, these are competition issues in name only. The behavior is equally problematic regardless of the antitrust standard that's being applied and regardless of whether a U.S. company has actually committed an antitrust violation. Second, the good faith conduct of foreign enforcers requires a different policy response, even if some may think a foreign enforcer's standards or remedies are very misguided. The most effective way to deal with good faith divergences from U.S. Standard, standards is to empower the U.S. antitrust agencies to cooperate effectively with their foreign counterparts. I want to stress that this is not just a theory. The U.S. antitrust agencies know this from decades of experience, and they have the benefit of hindsight. Cooperative relationships with foreign enforcers going back to the 1970s have also helped preempt such divergences in the first place. Through cooperation, U.S. competition experts have been invited to participate directly in foreign policy making. They've helped draft foreign competition laws, jointly develop best practices, and even train foreign judges and agency staff and much more. Progress is sometimes slow and incremental, but I think everyone on this panel would agree it's been enormously successful in the long run. Third, creating a working group to improve coordination between U.S. trade and competition agencies is a good idea in principle but it has its limits. Generally speaking, the concept of a working group sounds mostly benign, but if we were to put a working group in the White House and give it government-wide power to set international competition policy, we would create a massive lobbying target and risk politicizing competition law enforcement internationally. We would also send the wrong message to the rest of the world. In our words, we would be telling our trading partners to use an apolitical consumer welfare antitrust standard that protects competition and not competitors. But in our actions, we would be putting a political body in charge of international competition policy. And implicitly, we would be putting the threat of trade sanctions on the table at the behest of U.S. competitors. Our actions would speak louder than our words. We can expect our counterparts to respond in kind. We would risk losing our antitrust leadership status in the world. And worst of all, we would imperil the U.S. antitrust agencies' international cooperation efforts, which have been most effective. Alternative approaches to a politicized working group, such as an interagency working group that has an advisory role, are worth exploring. Fourth, and finally, it's important to remember that U.S. businesses operating internationally are sometimes mistreated in their capacity as buyers not only in their capacity as sellers. Many U.S. manufacturers, for example, are dependent on global supply chains and have to do business with foreign cartels. When they do, foreign governments sometimes harm competition and U.S. competitors by refusing to enforce their antitrust laws. To be fully effective, international competition policy reform should ensure that U.S. business victims are empowered to seek appropriate relief in U.S. court in these circumstances. Reform of this kind can help deter the proliferation of international cartels that are targeting American businesses and consumers. And finally, these reforms would complement many of the reforms discussed in the, in the ICEPEG report. I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the Congress members to ask their uh, five minutes of questioning, and we'll begin with the chairman of the full committee, uh, Congressman Goodlatte. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Abbott, I'll, I'll start with you on this question, but I'll ask all the panelists to uh, chime in on this as well. So we've been hearing a lot in this hearing about the problem of overly aggressive antitrust enforcement in some countries. But isn't it true that weak or non-existent antitrust enforcement can also be an international issue? For example, in May of 2015, 20 members of this committee wrote a letter urging that the U.S. take action to remedy unfair competition from the three major Gulf air carriers, uh, Qatar, Emirates, and Etihad. In this instance, the three airlines are completely exempted from their country's competition laws, and as a result, they are able to control aspects of the airline industry in ways 
making it impossible for others to compete. So aren't there two sides to this problem? Is there precedent for antitrust enforcement against state-sponsored or state-owned enterprises? Oh, th thanks for that question, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, in, in principle, uh, there should be. I'll do, do, start with quick analogies. You know, there's a U.S. Uh, uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act does not apply to the commercial activities, uh, say, of instrumentalities of a foreign sovereign. Uh, and it seems to me that if there's a direct, substantial, reasonably foreseeable effect on U.S. commerce from the activities of, of such instrumentalities, uh, in, in principle, uh, there's a, st a strong argument for applying jurisdiction. I won't get into it. There's some questions about uh, doctrines such as foreign sovereign compulsion or the act of state doctrine, which are limitations. They're not really international law rules. They're really, really, really rules of abstention in which courts, U.S. courts, agree not to uh, interfere in foreign policy decisions committed uh, to, to the executive branch. But it seems to me that... Uh, there is no constitutional reason why we could not, uh, if we chose, uh, take jurisdiction when the jurisdictional harm and appropriate contacts uh, could be made out. Mr. Stutz. Thank, thank you. This is, a, I think, a really important question. Um, Non-enforcement is problematic in a variety of different ways. Uh, one of, the, one of the issues that arises is an incentive problem. When, for example, a foreign cartel is injuring a U.S. business, oftentimes the host country, the foreign cartel, has no incentive to prosecute it. It's actually benefiting from the wealth transfer that's occurring from a U.S. business to the host country. Uh, and so that's why we have the effects test. Uh, it's a a doctrine created in the 1940s by Judge Learned Hand. I've only got two minutes left, and I want three more people to chime in. So. so just to sum up, it's incredibly important that U.S. victims and the U.S. government has the ability to bring cases uh, internationally. Thank you. Ms. Garza? Not to repeat what's already been said, but to say something. This is a, an example, I think, of where you can use the, the trade function of our U.S. government to help solve a problem. For example, uh, in the in trade agreements, it's not uncommon in a competition chapter for another jurisdiction to commit to the enforcement of antitrust laws to allow for non-distortive free competition, including by SOE. So I agree with you that in some cases, trade can be distorted by the fact that you don't have sound antitrust enforcement within another jurisdiction. That's something that we should continue to work on, both from the antitrust enforcement perspective and from the trade perspective. Thank you, Ms. Wong. Professor? Wong Irvin. Thank you for the question. So I, I agree with the report that addresses this. It calls for the Trump administration to support the establishment of an ICN working group on this serious issue of anti-competitive harm caused by state-owned enterprises. Uh, the OECD in a 2010 study um, reported that SOEs are often the recipients of state aids, and in many countries, the largest share of these subsidies is, is devoted to preserving loss-making SOEs. Thank you. And Professor Fox. Thank you. I agree there is a problem of under-enforcement, and this is a particular problem in cases where there are state measures um, or um, SOE, state-owned enterprises, um, to which the antitrust laws are sometimes not applied. Our laws should be applied against state-owned enterprises when they're acting in uh, commercial interests. In addition, I agree with Deborah Garza, there is much room for an integrated trade and competition committee to focus on exactly the problem of state restraints, which is usually foreign restraints that hurt us. It could be vice versa. And I would say in particular, uh, in thinking about problems, the vitamin C case in which um, uh, at so far in the litigation, China has been allowed essentially to um, immunize an export cartel directly into the United States, hurting Americans directly. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, but I do think that it's well worth exploring the, the underlying issue here, which is allowing uh, state-owned enterprises to do business in the, in the United States, a country that is very 
Um, uh, we we sh shy strongly away from, it's not that we've never done it, but we, we have very little in the way of state-run enterprises uh, in the United States domestically, but they have to compete with, with uh, foreign competition uh, that has all the benefits of, of that state uh, subsidy and sovereignty that goes with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Cicilline has, has uh, graciously uh, deferred to the ranking member, but uh, Mr. Collins has to go to, the, to a rules hearing meeting, and uh, Mr. Conyers has graciously agreed to allow Mr. Collins to ask his questions for five minutes. So thank both of you. Thank you all for the, for the courtesy of both sides, and I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. And again, I think just focusing on the issue here of, of uh, developing um, you know, what is happening in the international realm and how they're antitrust and keeping this very open as far as how do we address this and how do we not. I think, the, you know, it's really also something we need to understand. Antitrust laws were enacted for the protection of competition, not competitors. And I think that's something as we, as we look at. And this is, you know, Supreme Court actually saying that as well. So, um, and the concern is foreign countries are not doing that. They're using it in, in they're basically to uh, harm, in, in many ways, a, the, the markets or shape the markets, if you would. Um, and uh, Ms. Garza, in one of your, your testimony that a recommendation from the White House Working Group was meant to produce a forum in which sound and coherent trade and competition policies could be forged, not create an antitrust czar to direct antitrust enforcement decisions. Can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. I, I, we, I was really addressing the concern that was raised by Randy and, and Eleanor and that I've heard in the past that aren't, isn't what we're calling for is for a, this, an antitrust czar in the White House to direct antitrust policy. That's definitely not what our, what our concern is. Our concern is basically, has been set here today, to address this question of the misuse, potential misuse of antitrust law and lack of process that we've experienced by, in other jurisdictions and to make sure that the administration through all of its resources, including on the trade side as well as on the uh, antitrust enforcement side, are marshaled to focus on this issue. So the, our, the focus of our, our uh, group was not domestic antitrust enforcement. It was a question of how do we help to further our efforts to ensure that the 130 other nations that have antitrust laws are misusing them in a way that distorts trade and harms U.S. companies. Okay, in keeping with that theme, I think you brought up a good point, and I think when you're looking at our, our, our situation here, Mr. Abbott, how would you feel, how can we as the U.S. better situate ourselves to deal with this emerging issue as it is continued here, you know, to counter or prevent improper foreign uh, enforcement actions? Well, well, that's. Then we'll go to Ms. Fox. We'll just sort of catch around the line here. Sure, that, 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 that's a good question, uh, uh, Congressman. I, I think, you know, part of the recommendation was that we act a lot more vigorously to get the international bodies we're already involved in to highlight, to do peer review studies, and to, to emphasize those. Uh, and perhaps, you know, a working group could, not just in the bilateral antitrust discussions, but in perhaps higher level, higher level government discussions uh, raise these issues directly. I think it was already mentioned that President Obama raised an issue with the Chinese government about lack of due process, about locking people up in rooms. There needs to be perhaps more of that and perhaps more public attention uh, and, and public statements about that, you know, when uh, in the context of international meetings, bilaterals, not to tell governments what to do, but to raise the concerns at, at a much higher level. Yeah. Ms. Fox, I just, I'm going to elaborate, I'm going to put a little bit further. The question here is, is are we dealing then more with a, uh, a emphasis from the administration, from Congress? Is this a, a fix that we need to do in, in more of a diplomatic sense, or is this something that there is a legislative fix, or is there a policy fix? Uh, take Mr. Abbott and, and f take that, it's a great answer. I'm just curious, let's follow that logical step. What do you think? I had to push the button. There you go. Well, I, one should first understand what one means by misuse. It is used in at least two different senses. Um, one sense it is used is if our trading partners are not following, for example, U.S. principles of monopolization law, some people call that misuse, and I do not. And I think if that is the question, that some nations are applying their law in a way, for example, the privileges contestability of markets, um, that I think the answer is 
talk only t uh, between the competition agencies to try to get accepted their point of view. And if they yeah. don't get it accepted in the international marketplace, maybe it's not right, or maybe it is just not the way most people do it, and we have to live with that if it is within the area okay. of protecting robust markets. Oh. If it is the kind of atrocities um, that Alban Abbott just mentioned, uh, that is a serious problem that probably does need a higher level and a higher push. And starting with an integrated committee of trade competition and some others as the- Well, you've definitely found the city for talk in integrated committees. So that's a, we can definitely look at that. Um, Ms. Wanger, I know I'm running out of time. I think the biggest thing here is, is what we need to focus on is, is those examples that are always out there. But I think the focus of this hearing is, is a proper one in the saying, what is our response? What is the U.S.'s response? How are we dealing with it internationally? How are we dealing with it low, you know, in, internally? But also saying, is there ways that we can also, as we already are, with the leaders in, in the, especially the, these, many of these areas where they're being um, challenged, I guess is the best way to put that. So I think we're the leaders there. Let's continue to do so. And I appreciate the, the uh, opportunity to ask these questions. I appreciate, again, the kindness of the uh, chair and the uh, ranking member and others. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Congressman Conyers. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, today's hearing is the beginning of a examination and for some people a re-examination of uh, antitrust laws, American antitrust laws. Uh, how, I want to ask generally uh, for any of you or all of you that want to respond how is our country doing in terms of developing a fair antitrust policy uh, in, in comparison to other countries? In other words, how does this thing rank uh, globally? And uh, you, you may, any of you may start it off and, and continue it. Thank you for the question. I think that the U.S. is a leader in this field. We saw a revolution in our courts in the 60s and 70s, um, aligning antitrust with economics, with consumer welfare, which is a broad concept which really values what consumers are willing to pay for. And I think that that linking it to a, a, an economic concept and getting away from vague and subjective standards that can be misused and abused by, by agencies um, really gave a credibility to the U.S. and really helped to you know, promote what, what competition is about, which is about consumers and lower prices and better products. Yeah, but how do, how do we uh, stack up with uh, other countries? Uh, are they... Uh, looking to us for leadership, or, or do, do they think uh, as leading capitalist nation in the world, I mean, we, we may come off uh, in a poor light. Uh, I mean, after all, everybody's not into capitalism. Uh, and uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm reading between editions uh, of uh, review articles that we're failing in some respects and that we're doing great in, in others. And uh, I, I've never had five people with your backgrounds uh, to give me a little free advice on, on which direction, what, which direction are we going in, and, and uh, uh, what, ought we, what ought more do we, should we be doing uh, on this subject? And I'll uh, look, look at Professor Fox for, to start us off, and let's, let everybody that wants to chime in, and if you, you don't want to answer it, that's it, okay too. Thank you, Congressman, for that very interesting question. Um, how is U.S. doing in its fair competition policy compared with others in the world? 
In cartels, price fixing agreements were up there, gold standard number one. In monopolization, abuse of dominance, I think, unfortunately, U.S. has lost leadership by becoming very conservative and um, not finding very much that a dominant firm does is illegal. Uh, the European Union standard has gotten more prominence in the world uh, because it focuses more on access to markets by those who have been excluded and I think that is, in the world, perceived as more fair. What we should be doing, though, is a very difficult question because this is law formation. It goes through our courts. It goes up to the Supreme Court. Our Supreme Court has handed down decisions that fit with the narrow view of what should be illegal as monopolization. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good start. Where, where, where do you come in, Attorney uh, Stutz? Thank you for the question. I, I think it's, it's possible to admire the coherence and principled nature of the U.S. approach to antitrust law and at the same time feel concerned about some of the results it's wrought. We have a large concentration problem in this country. Competition is declining in a lot of sectors. Mm -hmm. um, it's understandable, perhaps, that other countries would look to the United States and, and seek to experiment. And, uh, there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of interest in, in finding ways to more aggressively enforce the antitrust laws in a principled way, and, and I support that. Uh, uh, very briefly, uh, Congressman, I think, uh, with all due respects, I don't believe that competition has diminished. Uh, I think that some recent economic research, I know that there have been claims have been made in the last year or two. I just don't think the best recent economic research supports that. And, and, and more generally, I think there, there needs to be a real concern that overemphasis on, and it's true, lots of countries emulate Europe, they have an administrative system, but overemphasis on uh, analyzing actions that do not harm consumers directly or do not deny access, and there's been some of that, could disincentivize innovation and, and harm our leading uh, competitors. Anybody else? Uh, look, we have 193 countries, and we have uh, 130 uh, uh, standards. Uh, what, what? I mean, the little countries, uh, they, they look at, uh, at a discussion like the one we're having this morning, and say, we, we can't even get in the door. I mean, there's such a disparity between the big nations and the little nations. And, and, and uh, I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable because the little nations, I mean, people say, well, who cares? And, and who asked you uh, to get in here anyway? Uh, could, could somebody, uh, this is my last uh, try at trying to put this into some perspective. May I, may I take a shot? Please. Okay, good. So I think two things. One is, I, just to be clear, it's not, I don't think it's the smaller economies that are the problem here. Uh, it's actually the, the large, some of the larger economies that are throwing their weight around. But the other thing I would say is that competition law has actually been very good for some of these younger and smaller economies. I've had the honor of being able to participate through the years in the International Competition Network and in other international fora and have met and talked to, as, as have other people here, Eleanor, Karen, uh, Alden, uh, Jim Rill, and have had the opportunity to spend some time, quality time, talking to a lot of those enforcers in countries in Africa, in South America, in Asia. And they recognize that a, that a sound competition law is actually good for them because it frees up the ability of, the, of their economy to grow. It removes artificial barriers to competition. It, it, it allows the spread of a better distribution of wealth. It allows for innovation. So competition law, we really feel, is good for not just the big 
developed economies, but it's good for the smaller economies. Keeping uh, this, uh, um, not having distortion of international trade, that benefits them. And so I've actually seen that there's a fair amount of consensus that's developed uh, in all of these international fora about the value of antitrust uh, competition for even those economies. C could I just... Or especially those economies. Mr. Chairman, uh, I just... I just want to, uh, I'm, I'm troubled by the fact that there's such an extreme difference between the big nations and, and, and the little nations. Uh, and I, I, uh, I resist the notion that, that this, the, the, little, the little ones are gonna, be very grateful to us for being so uh, thorough and fair and uh, concerned. Uh, look, capitalism doesn't work like that. I mean, in, 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 from my political perspective, uh, every, everybody's got to turn in some profit or you're gonna be hitting the door. And, and and this sounds this sounds like a a very mild discussion we're having, and and that for some reason I feel that there's some huge considerations about the differences laying around out here that uh, we've got to get into, and we probably will. Uh, uh, what can uh, 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 five m members of Congress do with five expert witnesses in a couple hours? Uh, so uh, what, what can you tell me that will make me uh, feel more satisfied than I, than I, that I am at the present moment? Um, Congressman, thank you again. Um, I think there is a huge problem that you have put your finger on, that little countries have needs that are not recognized and not recognized by the U.S. model of competition. This doesn't mean the U.S. model is wrong for the U.S. Small, there are some problems of jurisdiction. Um, there are some problems of simply inability of the small countries to, for example, enforce their law against cartels coming from the developed countries. The developed countries ought to have a rule that they cannot have cartels even if they don't hurt Americans, if they hurt only Africans, if they're clear illegal cartels in the U.S. It should be illegal in the U.S. That should be stopped where the action is. Right now, it's very hard mm. for small countries to defend themselves, and there are many actions that are targeted against small developing countries. Second, if you look at monopolization, as you pointed out, there are many small countries that have very different circumstances on the ground of what are the barriers to competition. They have many more barriers. They have excluded many, many people for a long time. They need laws that are more inclusive, that focus more on exclusionary behavior. Um, there are laws, formulations, that can be against exclusionary behavior and helping competition, not protecting inefficient competitors. So I think the first line is that that we as a country ought to recognize that and we ought to recognize that some countries need different standards than the way the U.S. has applied them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you've been very good to me and I appreciate it. I, I uh, want the witnesses to know that there's going to be trouble with some people getting their full amount of sleep tonight as a result of... <laughs> what's gone on here uh, in the House Judiciary Committee this morning. And I thank you very, very much for your presence. Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Congressman Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses for, for being here. Uh, Professor Wong Irvin, I, I listened to your testimony and you mentioned uh, the Korean sanctions against Qualcomm. 
Um, and I read your testimony, and you also uh, not only mentioned the Korean sanctions against Qualcomm, but also uh, the Chinese uh, sanctions against Qualcomm. I didn't uh, read in there a dispute that Qualcomm had, in fact, engaged in anti-competitive behavior, but rather an analysis of their uh, uh, the sanctions against them as being overbroad. Uh, I'm wondering. Uh, specifically, uh, and, and, and I, I should note, I, I, I believe that Taiwan is in, in, uh, investigating Qualcomm's anti-competitive behavior, uh, the European Union, as well as the United States uh, uh, FTC, uh, are all uh, doing that. You're not suggesting, are you, that the fact that a foreign government has found a uh, United States corporation to have engaged in anti-competitive behavior, that that in and of itself is uh, somehow wrong or unfair? Thank you for the question. No, I am not. So the many of the examples I gave, some were against Qualcomm, some were involved Microsoft, Nokia, um, there's several others involving Merck, AZ, Ericsson, they all have in common the lack of an effects-based approach, the lack of evidence of any actual harm to the competitive process or consumers. So for example, the China's decision against Qualcomm was based on excessive pricing something that we don't do in the United States. We don't regulate price, um, namely, particularly with IP, because we don't want to harm incentives to innovate, and because high prices alone don't harm competition. In fact, they can signal to a market that this market is profitable and you should enter and increase entry. And I don't mean to cut you off, but I only have a, a limited amount of time, and, and I'm not sure that I will uh, receive the uh, same treatment from the chair if I do go over, so I want to make sure that I uh, ask a few more questions. But um, Apple is also suing Qualcomm, are they not, for uh, a, a dispute concerning uh, com competitive behavior with their licenses? Is that right? Yes, that's, I believe that. Okay. Um, do you know of any... Uh, uh, any investigation of Qualcomm's uh, anti-competitive behavior by uh, the EU, Taiwan, the United States that has uh, been fully investigated and where a uh, country has come to the conclusion that Qualcomm has not engaged in anti-competitive behavior? Where an investigation has been dismissed. Um, after after a full investigation. After a full investigation, I, I do not. And many of the ones you mentioned, like you said, are just in the beginning stages. Uh, the one in the U.S. is just, you know, the government just pled its case. They still have to prove its case. But there is, there is some uh, a threshold to even begin an investigation. There has to be some uh, evidence that, that would lead a government agency to, to, to direct resources to, to do that, would, it, would there not? Not in other countries. So in China and elsewhere, they're obliged to investigate when there's complainants. So remember, China is largely an, an implementer of technology, not an innovator, and they have a lot of manufacturers that complain and say, I want lower royalties. And so they're obligated. They don't have to have a good faith basis. that They have to investigate. Um, Mr. Stutz, I want to ask you a quick question. Uh, what are the ramifications uh, to the United States in terms of, of uh, retaliation uh, if the United States acts uh, uh, either through a trade policy or otherwise um, with a foreign country uh, to, to benefit a particular United States corporation? I think the uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. I, I think the, the the obvious immediate risk is is retaliation, and uh, just the adoption of a political stance toward competition policy rather than a law enforcement orientation. Um, now, would that would that retaliation involve just one United States company, or would it involve many United States companies and affect our economy in terms of uh, uh, workers, employment, um, and our ability to trade with that foreign country? Thank you for the question. I think it should be seen as a risk that it, there would be a policy response rather than an individual response to a particular, a particular matter. Um, I do think it bears mentioning with respect to disputes involving multiple authorities investigating uh, you know, a, single, a single entity like Qualcomm. It's important to remember um, oftentimes there are not disputes in antitrust standards between countries. Oftentimes they agree uh, in the area of standard essential patent abuse, uh, there's a widespread consensus among enforcers, at least, uh, that this is, this is problematic and that competition law should address it. Uh, so oftentimes, 
when, when there's extraterritorial remedies, uh, lots of countries investigating a single, a single defendant, you can have a lot of efficiencies um, with a single remedy that can resolve universal concerns. So it cuts both ways. Thank you uh, for your answer. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, Congressman Cicilline. Thank you, and thank you again to the witnesses. Uh, I'd like to begin, Professor Fox. You mentioned that the United States might well be on its way to using antitrust laws to achieve nationalistic ends and sort of warned us about that. Could you speak a little more to that of, of uh, what concerns you're referring to? Yes, I mentioned I have this concern, and I also mentioned I haven't seen it happen yet. It is a general concern that simply comes out of, for example, meetings of the highest executive with merger parties who agreed to invest in America, and the uneasy feeling mm -hmm. that at some point that might be taken into account in letting a merger through lightly, and if that should happen. So I'm only saying be on alert. No, no, I, I understand. So, and I think the head, the acting chair of our FTC, um, in my view, clearly would not cave in lightly. The, the a nominee for justice would not cave in lightly, but I just say be on alert, because if that should happen, rule of law unravels and tit for tat could happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what makes the suggestion that we do everything that we can that I think everyone has suggested to depoliticize this work um, as much as we can. And so, Mr. Stutz, you mentioned maybe the idea of an integrated kind of interagency advisory role might be the best way to preserve the integrity of the work, but also reduce the likelihood that it becomes politicized in a way which would undermine the arguments we're trying to make to our trading partners around the world. Is That's right. Thank you for the question. And, and I want to stress, I, I very much agree and admire uh, the, the expert report's approach to thinking about the, the need for coordination and, and to conduct an examination into how uh, competition and trade policies fit together and how these agencies can more effectively function uh, by cooperating with one another. I think there's a devil in the details in how you do the working group. Uh, there's a way to approach achieving uh, those coordination benefits without putting the risk of politicizing on the table. Uh, and so, you know, I think an important, important point to remember is that not all decisions in, in competition and trade policy are necessarily susceptible to group decision making. Sometimes. Mm -hmm it's more effective to empower a single expert, or in this case, a, an expert agency to lead. And um, in my view, when you're dealing with uh, good faith disagreements over technical questions like antitrust standards and antitrust remedies, the US agencies need to be empowered to set policy. Um, yeah, and I think the thing that strikes me from the testimony of all the witnesses is that we have really four categories of cases and sort of or disagreements that would arise. One would be for countries that share our antitrust laws and the framework that we have and enforce it evenly against US companies and everyone else, which is of no concern to us. That's sort of the, the best kind of trading partner. The second group is people who share our standards and uh, have a framework which is similar to the United States, but apply it unfairly against a US company as compared to their own companies, which is bad faith and I think obviously of concern. The third is a country that doesn't share our standards, has a different set of standards than we might use, but applies it evenly to everyone, which is complicated. And then the third area is maybe the worst, they don't share our standards and they apply it worse against the US. But it seems to me we have to have the ability to understand those differences and shape remedies that are, reflect that. And what I wonder if Professor Wong or when you mentioned, and I think Professor Fox, the notion of trying to create at least some transparency in the way that we have seen success with the TIP report, obviously in a different area, trafficking in persons, where at least there's a kind of standard that's developed and some information about how the country uh, meets a standard in terms of seriously uh, uh, responding to the issue of human trafficking. This would be a lot more complicated because you have to acknowledge what's the standard, is due process available, are there anti-competitive policies, are they being applied evenly, even if they're bad policies? But it would seem like if we could 
agree on the creation of that report, it might be a good way to at least educate kind of the international community and American consumers and businesses what the uh, landscape is, and then, you know, encourage people to kind of think about wanting to improve where they stand on that uh, report. And, and I'd be curious to know what the panel thinks about that kind of approach as part of what we might do. Maybe start with Professor Fox. Um, thank you, Congressman. Yes, transparency would go a very long way. Um, transparency is a part of due process. Uh, if, if standards are transparent, that is the first step. And a second step is simply transparent but different. Lots of conversation to argue one way or the other that there is a better standard and taking into account when countries can't agree. But very constructive. Thank you. I agree that, thank you for the question, that it would be an effective interim measure to require this transparency. But in the long run, I think it's important for trading partners to understand the trade-offs, right? The trade-offs of considering non-competition factors are the difficulties of weighing and balancing various factors across different markets. It can actually undermine consumer welfare and undermine clear and predictable antitrust. So I think we should continue to advocate for a consumer welfare standard, but in the interim require transparency. Thank you very much, and I'll you back, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Congressman Radcliffe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses for being here. Uh, Ms. Garza, um, as you stated in your written testimony, one of the concerns here is the misapplication of foreign antitrust laws uh, by some of our trading partners to protect their home markets from competition, um, to protect their national champions, and uh, to force the transfer of uh, technology at royalty rates that favor local uh, technology implementers. Um, one of the solutions that the uh, ICPEG um, uh, report talks about is uh, for the U.S. to consider recommending that the OECD and other multilateral bodies uh, adopt minimum due process guarantees, and you, in your testimony, suggest that the, that the administration should continue and strengthen uh, both bilateral and multilateral efforts to establish standards and ensure that other countries to abide by them. So in the context of uh, trade law, I think we've seen that uh, this administration is emphasizing the need um, to shift away from broader multilateral trade agreements towards uh, more narrow bilateral trade agreements as a way to protect America's interests. Um, I want your perspective on how significant a role um, bilateral agreements play compared to the multilateral uh, approaches in the context of antitrust law and what would be the impact of a shift that the administration is proposing. Well, uh, that may be a little bit above my ability to, to respond, but I, I think uh, what we recommended in the ICEPEG report was a, was a combined approach basically working within multinational uh, entities and in multi-country uh, agreements, but also on a bilateral basis. So the fact, if the, if the trend was to go to bilateral agreements, we could still achieve our ends through those bilateral agreements, through competition chapters, uh, you know, having an understanding with the other country that the agreement is with about standards. Um, and they could be if you had an effort to develop a na an international consensus on certain minimum standards, that could be a reference point. So the, the multinational activities should continue to take place, and they really create the context and reference for the bilateral uh, agreements. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. Let me move it from, from theoretical into, into practice. So um, one of the report recommendations is the evaluation of <clears throat> trade agreements and the further assessment of the inclusion of competition chapters, as right. you mentioned, and um, right now NAFTA is being is currently being uh, renegotiated. So, what's your view on including a competition chapter in NAFTA? So, uh, the, the the view of IcePeg was that it'd be very helpful to have a comp I think there may be a competition chapter in NAFTA too. But what's happened with these competition chapters, as I understand it, is progressively they've gotten better and better. Uh, and so I think one of the things that we had suggested was that this working group take a look at what should, what should be in, ideally, these competition chapters. And to the extent that the administration is about to renegotiate or reopen any of these agreements, it would be good 
to have in mind what could be put in these chapters. And so, for example, the nice thing about having it in the, these chapters is that you have uh, a built-in framework for discussion uh, when you think that there have been violations, and you can just, you know, and, uh, and, and potential uh, solutions, how do we resolve disputes? We don't necessarily have that right now. So if you, you can have a problem, but the antitrust enforcement uh, agencies are really ill-suited to, to do anything to really address it. And, and you could address it in an ad hoc basis, but that has difficulties too. So the notion is step back, look at what we would ideally want, put it into these bilateral or multilateral agreements, and increase your ability when things come up to address them early and to address them effectively and to have a meeting of the minds as to how you're going to address them. So, so we think that that could actually be very helpful in resolving the issues going forward. Thanks very much. Um, Professor Wong Irvin. Um, uh, Professor Fox, as I understand her testimony, is that she doesn't think that the, the United States has the uh, one right mold um, for antitrust rules and standards or the balance uh, between antitrust laws and intellectual property rights. Do you agree with that assessment? I do not. I think that the U.S. is a leader in innovation, and a lot of that is because of our incentives to innovate. Um, I also think the Supreme Court correctly recognized the errors of the concerns about false positives or, or type one errors, and the idea that it's more dangerous to intervene when it's unwarranted than to, um, than, than to not intervene because the market can more readily correct. Um, than, than when courts or agencies intervene inappropriately. Thanks very much. I'll yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes the congressman from Georgia, Mr. Hank Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I think uh, I thank you all for your testimony today. I think we can agree that there should be more integration between global trade and antitrust policies laws and agreements between nations. Um, I think I take it from what you all have said that you all would agree with that uh, statement. And um, also um, that we must respect how foreign trading partners formulate and apply their antitrust laws. We must respect that, but if they fall short then there should be uh, shame, there should be name and shame applied from the highest levels of our government. Uh, in other words, public disclosure of abusive uh, practices and applications by foreign governments of their own laws. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but what I want to ask the panel is to what extent, to what extent do uh, the uh, Trump policies and pronouncements of America first, the rhetoric and the policies that ensue from that, the policies to withdraw from uh, uh, negotiations uh, for the TPP, the threats surrounding uh, NAFTA made by the president, what to what extent does, do the rhetoric and practices of this administration have on foreign governments uh, and their um, mindset in terms of applying their own antitrust laws? Uh, Professor Fox. Um, thank you. I think the announcement of my country first is not, is not fortunate and is not limited to the United States. We're in a world today where many countries across the world have a my country first policy. Well, the U.S. Uh, being the leading trade partner and the preeminent uh, yeah. antitrust enforcement regimen, uh, what does it say when we stoop to the level of America first? Well, if it means that we will uphold conduct by our companies and apply a different standard to the rest of the world, it's a very negative message. 
It can mean other things. I'm hopeful maybe it will mean other things. But if it does mean nationalism, parochialism, it is very, and this applies to the trade agreements you mentioned, it is bad for America. America gains with these trade agreements. America would have gained with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I want to add here that the competition chapter and the SOE chapter in Trans-Pacific Partnership are very well done and very important and can be models for whenever we're ready again to have multilateral agreements. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hate to cut you off, Professor Fox, but I wanted to get Professor Wong Irvin's view, view on that. Sure, thank you for the question. So as part of my job, what I do is I train foreign enforcers and judges around the world. My institute trained over 300 last year, primarily in China. And I get this question a lot. And um, my answer is that I'm optimistic that antitrust has remained largely non-political across well, administrations. But it, but it seems that we're headed in the opposite direction under this current administration. Would you agree? I'm hopeful that the, uh, the, that, uh, the, the appointees for Department of Justice Antitrust and the acting chair, that, um, and particularly I know the acting chair of the FTC, um, that they are- and I, must uh, inter I must interrupt you. Yeah. Let me move to Ms. Garza and let me get a straight answer from Ms. Garza. Straight answer, okay. All right, what I'll say is I'm, I, I recognize the concern, but I don't think we've seen any evidence yet. Okay, of a thank problem. you. Thank okay. you, Ms. Garza. Mr. Abbott, I'm trying to do this within my five minutes. Uh, Congressman, I think I'll second Ms. Garza. I know there was a, uh, okay. some discussion, but right. I agree. Okay, thank you, Mr. Abbott. And last but not least, Mr. Stetz, who appeared to be very intense uh, uh, in his desire to respond. Well, thank you, Congressman. I, uh, time being what it is, I'll just say that it's it's the merits of, of nationalistic policies are uh, more debatable in other contexts, but it's, it's important to remember that antitrust is law enforcement, uh, and it needs to be driven by facts and law, uh, and that's critically important, and that it, it becomes dangerous um, to apply policy uh, and, and in, a, in a law enforcement context. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize myself for questioning. Uh, I'm not a supporter of NAFTA. I've seen what it has done to uh, my district significantly, and uh, people on both sides of the party, people not involved in politics, how much they've been put out of work. And I think it's about time we have a president that stands up and says, U.S. first. We have tremendous trade deficits with other countries that we haven't even approached over the last uh, eight years. So uh, each of you can respond, if you'd like, to this question or the statement that I'm going to make. How do you deal with uh, countries, whether they're democracies or uh, whether they're dictatorships, uh, to follow the rules? Do you actually think that China's going to sit down? And we throw this word transparency around like it's uh, uh, it's the panacea. Uh, do you actually think China is going to be transparent with us? Uh, do you actually think uh, uh, other countries are going to be transparent? This is about profit. This is about making sure that whoever, such as China, as they did with Qualcomm, this is about profit. I wonder if China is going to reduce its prices based on how they force or are forcing U.S. companies to lower their prices. You don't see that. So let's get down to where the rubber meets the road and give me just one example other than penalizing countries, whether it's through sanctions, whether it's through trade, on how to play on a level playing field. Ms. Garza. The issue that you've uh, identified is really part of the impetus for our, our report, which is to say that there are some things that you can deal with through talk and uh, on, but through the antitrust enforcement agencies. And there are other things, other instances where you can't. So with respect to China, China has an antitrust enforcement agency that 
that the U.S. And, and Europe have worked with, but a lot of their decisions aren't being driven by the conclusions of the, uh, their competition law enforcement agency. They're being driven by different conclusions. And so part of what the group felt was that when you have decisions being taken at that level by another jurisdiction, you have to meet them at that level. You can't send, you know, it's like you can't take a gun to a knife, I can't take a knife to a gunfight. Right. Right, so, you, so if they're dealing with it at that level, we have to deal with that at that level. And during the Obama administration, that, that happened, uh, in fact. And part of what we're saying is, all right, with, to the new Congress and to the new administration, let's talk about what we've seen over the last eight years. Let's try to get this right. We realize that there are a lot of issues competing for your attention and resources. We think that this is a good issue. You're focused on trade. You're focused on America first. This is a component of that and why we recommended that there be a focused look at that integrate competition, but also trade. And think about how to deal with the, the issue that you've raised in a smart way and in an effective way. Professor. Thank you for the excellent question. So I serve as a, a scholar in a prominent Chinese university, and uh, with a, there's a member who is of the expert advisory committee. And, and I was told by him and by, by many other people that China was horrified when, when President Obama and when others made these public statements of concern, that they want to be considered as part of the mainstream, they, they are worried about their credibility, and that it did make a big difference. I, I agree, though, that it is about profit and about lower prices for them, and um, you know I do. I think this needs a multi-pronged solution. Mr. Abbott, oh, Mr. Chairman, I, I sort of echo what what uh, Ms. Garza said. If, if you really believe that something has been driven purely politically, and is doing real harm, uh, certainly the U.S. has some statutory authority. It's not saying when you should use them, but there's things like Section 301 of the Trade Act which allows for some retaliation, not saying in any case, but it's out there and, and in the appropriate con, 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 times might be weighed. Also, there are cases, for instance, the merger of two state-owned Chinese enterprises we think will harm competition, U.S. Uh, uh, you could maybe, you could take antitrust action against that. There's also ways of uh, uh, going, blocking imports under Section 337 of the Tariff Act that they think if they violate U.S. patent rights or unfair competition. We haven't raised that, but there are a number of tools out there that at least merit consideration. Professor. Thank you. I think this is exactly the question that an integrated working group would try to deal with. It's very hard to deal with. I want to echo remarks that Professor Wang Irwin made um, about Chinese enforcers who really want to abide by international standards and the people on the ground can't always get their way, but they've made progress. And the more they really want to abide by international standards, including holding the SOEs to account, the more we do gain somewhat more of a level playing field. And how to deal with the fact that the highest ministries of China are pushing for unlevel nationalistic policy is a very big, high-level question. Mr. Stutz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, want to, I want to read a short quote uh, from the Deputy Assistant Attorney General, Debbie Platt Majoris, uh, after a, a high-profile divergence in a, in a high-profile merger case between the United States and EU. They reached different conclusions on the same merger. She said, we recognize that we in the EU will not always agree and that our way is not always best. We have no power to change EU law other than by persuasion and vice versa. That's a really important point. Even when we're talking about sanctions and more aggressive tactics, ultimately we have no power other than to persuade. And so I think it's, it's extremely important that we think about what's most effective in how we can persuade. Uh, and it's my view that when there are aggressive bad faith acts by our trading partners, we may want to consider aggressive responses, but the past has shown that when we're dealing with good faith, good faith differences, cooperation is more effective. Thank you. I think the U.S. on its own would have a tremendous impact on this, but we, can't, we cannot change minds of uh, the leaders in, in China. Uh, what that is going to take is a unified effort of most of the countries around the world to let China know that we will come together and move as one 
if China wants to continue to abuse these uh, anti-trade issues. Uh, in numbers, there is strength. So with that, this, co this concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of you for attending. It's been very enlightening. We could probably spend the next six hours here uh, talking about these issues, but I think we have started something here today uh, that uh, we can take that ball and run with it. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials. Uh, for the record, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.